Thank you for that. The, uh, abortion. There are some other do to's and do from, but that's the. Uh, <laughs> and if they, if they uh, remain unpaid and they miss their agreement, it moves into tax, well, tax uh, or accounts receivable or tax liens. We uh, we will uh, supplement the tax the sewer okay. assessment onto the property taxes, and then it starts that whole process. Right. Okay. Right. It's all related to the, to the uh, infrastructure improvement about a decade ago. Uh, half of that cost is to be collected through assessments to property owners who benefited from that investment. And that money simply hasn't flowed in to keep pace with the debt service yep. required. And with the recession, that kind of, you know, I think we ended up in some respects giving some allowances or reworking some <coughs> agreements to <coughs> give folks the opportunity to. Right. So slow down their payment schedule. Okay. Mm. okay. Inventories and supplies. Uh, on the school side, that's their foods, food, nutrition, mm. surplus foods that they might have on hand. And on the town side, it's, um, again, this number only changes once a year, but it's essentially how much fuel we have, you know, in our tank at the right. party is monetized. So that's, that pretty much makes up most so, of the fixed assets. Yeah. I mean the assets. Assets. Okay. So if I can ask Councilor Hayes, um, would it be prudent if we uh, maybe concentrate on balances greater than 100000 Sure. Yeah. If that's okay. There's a few small line items that, yeah. 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 Um, you know, $7,000 is a, on a $42 million. <laughs> um, it's a little bit <clears throat> minute. Okay. The liabilities are... Items that we owe to other people for various purposes. Encumbrances are the purchase orders that we issue. We haven't paid those out. It's a promise, uh, a promise of the vendor to supply us with something, and a promise for us to pay them for those. Yeah. House payables are those items that we have purchased or goods received, and uh, we owe those funds. Can you? Excuse me. I'm sorry. Encumbrances are sort of the total purchase orders. For the year that are kind of at, at this point in time, yeah, that are outstanding. That are outstanding. But the product, but the product may not have been delivered at this point. Right. Like for uh, for example, Public Works may uh, through the budget process have been approved for some mm -hmm. projects that might yeah. be like yeah. three or four thousand dollar yeah. item. So they put the purchase order through, uh, but they may not get it for another three or four months. Okay. And in point of fact, Public Works does use the commerce process. Quite extensively. Fuel, fuel's another good example. Okay. We'll typically take a, a big PO out that estimates that approximates the total annual usage, and then as we draw it down, um, that number will go down. So it, it does overstate liabilities somewhat if we haven't actually incurred those things. I mean, just in my mind, I'm just right. thinking we really haven't, that's money we haven't spent. <laughs> the, the purpose Sorry. of a, the uh, purchase order is it's more, <coughs> not so much on this side of the sheets, but on the expenditure side itself. It's a way of saying, okay, I budgeted X number of dollars, but I know I can't use this right. much of it. We haven't written the check, okay. but we've committed ourselves. To okay, it. thank you. So it gives the department an opportunity. Well, it, just to be clear, you committed yourself in the sense that you've issued the purchase order to the company, right. which is a promise to pay, so it, it is legally binding. Yeah, and so long as they as long as they deliver, it is legally them. binding. So you have to. <clears throat> that's why you have to account for it as a liability. Yeah. And accounts payable are, are the, is the real. You've actually yeah. received the goods or services, and it's now a the wait for check. Yep. Wait for the check. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next two, well, the next one is is all payroll related. The fourth one, accrued payroll, again, is a once a year entry, mm -hmm. and essentially what it is is uh, at the end of the fiscal year, assuming we assume that the town of Scarborough will continue, but this assumes that at the end of June 30th, the town of Scarborough sort of ceases to exist. Mm -hmm. What do we owe the employee? And, and that includes the teachers, there's contractual obligations. So on June 30th, this is what we would owe the employee. Um, what portion of that is the, t is the I'm trying to remember the um, school. It's so like one point, like all of it? <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> yep. There might be like uh, <clears throat> maybe a couple hundred thousand in this town, but the bulk of it is, is school. And just, keep, and just for the citizens yeah. to keep in mind that they're watching and here, um, and that's because teachers and other staff are, may not be in the building in the summertime, but based on their pay schedule, they are still paid over the summertime. And you, and you, right, where municipal, on the municipal side, they're working 12 months out of the year, so it's a little bit different. They're 
contract. That's why we carry it. September to or October, right. well, September to August, and so during those last July and August periods, it's part of the old contract, and therefore we right. owe them those funds. Yep. This was an unfunded liability, and, and our auditors were after us. You probably remember this during your prior mm -hmm. term on council, and yep. it was a big, big uh, project to, to, fund yep. it. to fund it. In fact, that started in uh, 2000 when I was on the school board um, because there was a, a lot of need, and it, that fund was um, used to be able to supplement that. And so it took us quite a few years to get back to where we finally fully funded it. Um, so uh, they've done an incredible job keeping it there, too. The next few items are, um, well, the next larger one is deferred tax revenue. Uh, again, that's a once a year item, and what happens is at June 30th, uh, we can take our unpaid property taxes. We can, we can assume the next two months are good, good monies that we're going to actually collect and record those. And then the balance is recorded as a deferred tax, which you know, that number fluctuates annually based on, you know, where we are for our outstanding property tax. And that's a, a requirement of the, the accounting rules. Performance guarantee monies are essentially have to do with this, uh, developers who come in and they may put together some development and there might be some piece of it that's not done and so the town Money. Holds money until those things are done. If they finish them, we give them back their money, and if they don't finish them, we keep the money and essentially do it ourselves. If we don't accept letters of credit, we actually uh, take cash and mm. we hold it uh, to make sure they perform. Oh, that's wow. good, actually. Yeah, that's great. Right. Release it, obviously. Uh, oh, it's kind of a withhold, kind of. It is. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's to make sure that once the project's done, and there's always some lingering things, um, yeah. the work, 100% uh, of the work will get done. So how much is it, like 10% of the project, or is it, how do we? Uh, there is a formula, okay. forgive me, I, I can provide that to you, but yeah, there's, there's a very uh, uh, documented formula in terms of amount of retained interest. And the next one, large one, is a bonds payable. Uh, it's a bond anticipation note, actually, uh, for $2 million. We just issued those in December for the, and I already forgot the name of it, the, the property Benjamin Farm. Benjamin Farms, thank you hmm. very much. Good job. I had no <laughs> idea what I'm, I'm getting back into the click here. I'm yeah. trying to remember, yeah. <laughs> it was for the purchase of the Benjamin Farm properties. And we'll replace those tax anticipation notes with formal long-term financing later this fall. We'll bundle it with others. Yeah. That takes care of most of those. And the rest of it has to do with various types of, we have our estimated revenue, uh, hmm. equal our appropriations. Fortunately, we have a balanced budget and then the actual revenues, the actual expenditures, and then the rest of those are various um, fund balance amounts, the reserves, the... Ruth, um, is it under the fund balance reserved, is the bulk of that, in fact, the accrued payroll? It's, uh, yes. It could be um, accrued pay payroll. It could be um, various carry forwards from prior years. Purchase orders from the prior My year. point is, we show that payroll expenses, as Ruth explained, as a liability. We actually have fully funded that, yep. and so it's reserved. It's reserved for that purpose. Though it's considered part of fund balance, it's a reserved part of fund balance. So the differentiation between accrued payroll, which is 3.8 million, I'm rounding, versus the fund balance reserve of 4.3 is 1.5. Is that the one? I uh, can't remember the name of the ratio or the reserve ratio where, you know, the uh, payables, basically, you have to hold into reserves at least one month's worth of... No, that's the, that should be the fund balance unrestricted amount. That is the, okay. Um, the rest of that money is made up of uh, crude sick based on uh, the mm. various policies and contractual obligations. Mm. That's the amount of sick time that would be owed to people. Again, these are these. And again, that most we, of it once a year. These were prior considered, and they were unfunded liabilities. We've now funded them, but we've got a reserve, but we can't spend that money for something else. We've got to hold it for that purpose. Okay. And then, if we go to the second page, well, they're not numbered. It's the uh, the revenue. And we have various 
line items, we've got them grouped into various categories. Taxes include property taxes, excise taxes, boat excise taxes. It also includes franchise fees. And the way we work in accounting is we we record the revenue up front for all of the property taxes. That's why it looks like we're so much collected. And then we show it as a receivable on the balance sheet account. Okay. Um, interest is the interest on taxes. Licenses and permits are fairly self-explanatory, I think. Intergovernmental revenues include monies that are uh, collected for, from the state, from other municipal agencies, from the county. Charge for services include some of the, uh, you know, when when we bill out for rescue, for example, okay. or if, in some respects, when we charge our <coughs> departments, so some of that is interdepartmental. Uh, Public works charges for vehicle maintenance services yep. and fuel. Fuel is a big part, yep. Fines include parking fines, false alarms, uh, dogs running loose, blah, 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 fees like that. Miscellaneous revenues is everything that doesn't fit into another category. <laughs> so it, it could be a number of things. Uh, we have a few grants out there, so those are 5000 worth. And then other financing sources are generally those interfund items, such as or TIF or credit enhancement agreements. And those usually come in once a year towards the end of the year, so those will low. And then we have the school's numbers. Yep. Going, going back to the charge for services, is just that three nine, is that just a timing issue that is, has to do with when the services are billed? Uh, some of it could be. Some of it, um, I'm trying to think of an example, some of them may not show up until the spring because some of that is related to planning. Community services is in there. Okay. The summer rec program may not. So, so nothing, nothing's concerning. To yeah. Okay. <coughs> on the expenditure side. So can you? Um, I'm sorry. On the bottom, the property tax collected, it says it's 50.58. Can you just reference those two calculations? Six um, month 50. So we're better. We're better. We're better than. We're better than 50 percent collected. Do you, um, just from a, I know that we're going to talk about the trends piece. Is are we better at this point than we have been in the past? Are we equal to? We're actually a little bit better than we have been in the past. Mm -hmm. Usually we're around 49 point something percent. So we have gotten. We've improved. Okay. On the expenditure side, we break these out into various categories, which have served us well. Whether they continue to do so or not will we'll be, we'll be determined. Um, everybody's pretty much right on track in terms of where they are. County tax towards the bottom is 100% spent because we have to pay yeah. that. In library, we, they bill us, we pay them quarterly and they they look for the money at the first of the quarter. Right? Yep. We're just in the first or the third quarter, and yep. so there's 75%. And public works, again, they use a lot of purchase orders, utilize a lot of purchase orders, so that's why they look a little bit higher than normal, and that's because they've committed some of those funds. Debt service also, we have to make our principal payments in the fall and one interest payment in the fall, so that usually looks higher. And then the school is below that, and again, they're between. They're about 50 percent spent, so they're they're pretty much right on track also. So, um, only because it's <laughs> it is a uh, zero line. What's this uh, storm-related expenditures? Is that something we've consolidated now elsewhere? Is it extraordinary? I remember a couple of years back when we had some. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking way back. Some really bad storms, and so they wanted it line item. Is that what that was? Correct. And, okay. Um, it, it's mostly we used to combine them within the departments, and then uh, when we were audited, they wanted all the FEMA stuff and NEMA oh, okay. related yeah. stuff to show separately. And yeah. um, I would have hidden that. Yep. Yep. No, sorry. Just want to make sure. 
capital also equipment includes not only items from the current year budget, but those items from prior year budgets that may not be finished. So sometimes that number, while it doesn't look bad this right now, sometimes that can look a little skewed. Hmm. The next page shows both revenues and expenditures for the remaining funds of school and town. Both have special revenue funds, both have capital projects, and then we have cemeteries and they have scholarship and nutrition, food, services. Special revenues are those items that the funds that we receive are restricted for specific uses. Yep. And there's no budget, generally speaking, with those, so that's why right. the percentages is really awful. Yep. <laughs> And then the final page, the last two pages, is the breakdown of the school department in its various categories. And then the last page are just selected revenues, some of the larger revenues. The permits, uh, like we reported just 30 days ago, still still lagging a bit. We don't expect to see much much movement. <laughs> Uh, until the weather improves <coughs> later in the spring. Europe is the, um, urban, I, I don't think it's called it anymore, but it's the Urban Rural Initiative Program, which is uh, from the state to help with roads and things. Correct. And they started paying us once a year up front, so we, we don't argue with it. So, um, where is I, I, before I go? I wanted to ask about the, de the debt, the total debt of the town versus the total debt. Let me, let me change that. The total debt of the municipal operations versus the total debt of the school departments, in comparison to their debt service. So, um, what would be the total debt of the town, to, uh, roughly? Because um, I don't see it. Total outstanding is just under 100 million, million, like 96 or 97 million. Can you remember the breakdown between town and school in that, roughly? No, I don't. Okay. But I can get that. Yeah, I think that um, there's been some attention to debt service, uh, so that would be uh, really helpful. And on the uh, I shouldn't say debt service, debt and debt service, so yeah. The debt on the school's portion, the little breakout that shows regular instruction, et cetera, et cetera, they break their debt out towards the bottom, their last line. And then the town's debt is shown separately also on the You're looking at total debt service. incurred, not debt service, not payments. You're looking at what? Yeah, what the, each of the I areas. mean, I can tell by looking at the debt service for each, but I don't have the we'll give you the total for each. Yeah. I mean, I, okay. yeah, that would be helpful. There are state laws that guide um, the total debt that we can we can incur, and I believe right. it's five percent. Um, we'll provide the calculation, mm -hmm. but I believe we're one. We're not, maybe not even one percent at this point. That's not to say we aren't. Um, I, I can't ever imagine being anywhere near five percent. Uh, it's a scary number. It's for schools. You can't go over fifteen percent of the total something valuation, I believe, town valuation. But that's in the billions. So you take fifteen percent of something that's. Really I, I remember uh, uh, reading something in the bond package or whatever. Um, this assessment that. I thought it was 50. It can't be total debt cannot be more than 50% of total valuation. 15, I, I don't think. For the total total. total. For the total total, which is like $550 million, right. which is just astronomical. So if we could get something on that, that would be really helpful educationally, I think, to see and then to compare that to where we are maybe in a five-year trend. Well, we've been over the past five years, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe... I'm trying to remember now. Officially, the recession started seven, eight. No, sounds right. Huh? Yeah. Seven, eight. So, some ways, like right when the recession hit, that would be great. Mm -hmm. So, um, any questions for Ms. Porter? No, thank you, Tom, about the financials. Great um, job. Yeah. Great. Um, thanks. So moving on, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, moving on is an introduction uh, discussion on the fiscal year 2016 budget presentation. 
Um, the first item that we have is um, really more of inform um, information for us to begin to think about. Um, both um, Mr. Hayes and I are sitting on the joint committee with the, uh, with the school board, so this is really not um, an exercise to try to set the budget schedule because we're going to be doing that uh, collaboratively, collaboratively with the school board, but really what's presented here is a timeline um, that is similar to the prior year uh, without the specific times actually included. Um, and it's for consideration because there's been several ideas that have been posed to us, or at least to me, um, in my notes about maybe, uh, as an example, consideration that we have our um, school board budget presentation a little earlier um, in, the, in the session uh, rather than later, um, although there's timing challenges not only within the two departments of the town and the school, but there's also the state numbers that come in that is a very different timeline than the numbers that we get on the, on the municipal side, so we're trying to kind of herd cats while we're <laughs> trying to uh, be mindful of everyone's schedule, but it's something that we are, this is an um, action item at our next meeting. That joint session is going to be on January 22nd at 1.30 p.m. Uh, here in Chambers uh, with the school board, so uh, we'll be hopefully finalizing um, that schedule. And to that end, I'm certainly pleased to work with, uh, with you, Sean, but I know George and I will um, have done work already, and we will be prepared to have a proposed process and timeline yep. you know, to kick around and to, sure. to talk about and modify. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to bring uh, Chris Siazzo, who is the chair of the Finance Committee for the School Board, into that uh, into that group discussion so that the four of us can, because um, I agree, I don't like entering a conversation uh, with a blank sheet of paper. I prefer at least a baseline. Um, understanding it can go up and down and I change. I we will be incorporating some of the notions and ideas that came forward in your initial joint right. meeting in terms of switching up the process. The timeline is a bit more challenging, mm -hmm. and, and perhaps for Peter's benefit, uh, typically I propose the budget in late March. Uh, the month of April is really devoted to the Finance Committee and maybe a little into early May in terms of detailed review. And during that time, the Council is um, it's technically an ordinance, so it goes through first reading and public hearing, and all of it points toward adoption in early May. And that, that timeline is really dictated in large part, if not entirely, by the school validation vote, which is, a, which is an afterthought. Yeah. And if history suggests anything, hmm. uh, we need to go at least twice, sometimes three times to the voters. And so that's why we find ourselves targeting that first validation vote in mid-May. It gives us enough time to be able to rework the budget and go back out, uh, that's really put pressures. And the earlier that we submit the budget, well, let me rephrase that, it would be my preference to submit it later because our information is better. Uh, mm -hmm. The earlier we do it, the less information we have. And this, this year is going to be particularly challenging um, if the last biennium budget, biennium budget for the state suggests anything, it will be late June before they have their wrestling match completed. And we'll know where we stand. So there's going to be a number of things uh, we're sitting and waiting for, frankly. Mm. And uh, with the recent communication from the governor's office regarding mm -hmm. the budget proposal, um, and not to politicize, so it's, to me it's um, not an issue whether we agree or disagree with the proposal. It's the timeline of how things happen. Right. Um, it is a, going to be a very rigorous, rigorous uh, wrestling match on determining where we're going to be um, in the end because there is so many uh, moving Unknowns. It's, it's, it's going to be incredible, not only for the legislators to be able to get their work done, but for the local municipalities, and it's just not us, it's everyone. It does look, however, it's the second year of the biennium that most of these mm -hmm. big tax changes happen. Right. So we may be a little better off in that for this budget we're, we're looking at right now, we won't have to know all those answers, right. uh, uh, which will be a, a blessing, frankly. Yeah. Um, EPS, is, uh, you know, general purpose aid education is always a question mark. Uh, and we'll be right down mm -hmm. to it. It'll be one of the final numbers established, I suspect. Mm -hmm. So in, in setting this, not only do I want to make sure that the other finance committee for the school board is involved, but even to some extent um, the rest of the town council, because you know, I, just as an example, one recommendation that's been made is that we actually, if we need to go beyond June, we go beyond June, but the challenge with that legally is um, what is the public's perception of that? Um, going into the next fiscal year before we've proved it because the state mandates that if we do not have an approved budget by June 31st, then the budget um, of the previous year is what is enacted um, automatically in its stead until the budget is passed. We also have local charter requirements that speak to that. Right. 
that once I hand a budget to you, you have 60 days to pass it. Right. If you don't, then, it, then frankly, the budget I submit is what's, uh, yeah. what is approved, which uh, seems a bit draconian. This never happened before, yeah. but that's just something to be mindful of. Um, I would love to get some input from you, though, in terms of our your internal review process. Yeah. What this uh, chart lays out is the is the typical approach, which is we schedule 15 or 20 minutes or half an hour for every department head to sit in front of you and to kind of for you to go through their their lines. Um, I think Sean suggested that that may not be the most efficient way to do it, and I'm all for switching that up if that serves your purpose. Sure. So um, at least to begin the conversation, I think having what we did last year, if you're okay with this, as a starting point, it's the baseline. Mm -hmm. And then we can talk about when, when uh, Councilor Donovan gets back, we can talk about are there any efficiencies in that conversation. Um, one of the things that I'm going to be actually proposing and that I'll um, share is, um, I'll give you a copy. I'll give you, a, I hate to do this over the, I can give this one to you. I'm actually going to be submitting to the, at least to the council um, for our consideration, uh, what I would call a priority list. And what I'm asking the counselors to do is that based upon, now uh, if you guys would like to see it afterwards, I'll, I'll make sure you get a copy, the, the members in the audience, um, is to ask the other counselors to prioritize what areas that they really want us to focus in on first. Um, and the goal is here is that as they receive the budget, that they sit there and say, well, we absolutely want to talk about the police department first. That way there might be some departments because of their um, it either remains unchanged or if there's a decrease, do we really want to scrutinize it, you know, line item by line item when it's held flat um, from a big picture perspective. Um, I, you know, but the other counselors may sit there and say, I want to do line item by line item, which is what we've done for years. And it's just, to me, it's like, um, you know, you know, it's just a, not a fruitful ex exercise in my head. So I'm at least going to submit this to everyone and ask them to kind of, and uh, there's three sections. There's the high priority. I've asked for them to prioritize up to six items, um, medium priority, and then the lowest priority. The goal is that we um, really focus on the big areas. And so to me, it's, I think a little bit more globally, um, I'd like to know about cost drivers. I want to know what are the big pieces. I don't need to know whether it's the greatest cost driver for health care is in community service department versus, um, you know, whether uh, public safety. I mean, it's health care, right? So I look at it a little differently, but I want everyone to chime in and, and kind of give us a, some direction on what level of detail. I call it the strainer effect. Mm -hmm. how, big do, how big of a strainer do you want? How big are the holes going to be in the amount of information that filters through? Um, everyone has a different tolerance and a different expectation. So. I want to at least pro I'm going to propose that to everyone to see if that kind of works from a management perspective. And then what I'm going to do once I receive these back is to sit down with you, Tom, and um, kind of um, identify what external or internal resources we may need as a committee to um, address those. I'm going to take everyone's stuff put together. Yeah, um, one way or another, you'll have probably five to six weeks of yep. time to kind of do your review, and how you choose to, to do that yep. is certainly something that... Uh, we can talk about. Yeah. I mean, the, the difficult piece is that, um, you know, in the perfect world uh, in governance, the committee comes together, makes its recommendation, takes it to the full council. There's some trust in that development. You ask questions in the significant areas, then you move forward. But when it comes to finance, it's like uh, you have a committee of three, then you really have a committee of seven, and now, based on our new relationships with the school board, mm -hmm. we really have a committee of 14. Um, or, but then there's the other subcommittee of six. So I'm, I'm trying to really uh, get everyone's input at the different levels and be respectful of those levels. So I'm kind of hoping this helps. That's okay. okay. Is, that good, is that a good yeah. approach? Yeah. Okay. One other thing I'm proposing, uh, proposing to do, which I think really speaks to what you're talking about and, and might, might really focus attention, is uh, for my presentation of the budget, though we will continue to maintain all of the line item details because it makes sense and it's important to us behind the scenes. But I find that that is a distraction. And it, contains a lot of extraneous things. Uh, you know, there's over 500 line items, many more than that, actually. And so I've, I've talked to the department heads, and we're going to come forward with a new budget format, which all the same um, information there is, but we're going to introduce a qualitative piece and include a cost driver piece. So in a quick snapshot, someone can pick it up and understand what the various departments do in a quick read and get a sense, a higher level sense, there might be eight or 10 or 12 common line items that we report each department. Mm -hmm. um, 
but again, the line item detail will continue to exist, but it doesn't need to be part of the presentation because I think it ends up being kind of just noise and distraction, distracting. So really trying to get you to focus at the macro level rather than my brain. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I think that's great. Um, in essence, the line item becomes an appendix to the actual presentation of the budget. Um, and one of the things that I didn't present here is really what is that next step after this prioritization is done. And, um, one of the items that I'm going to recommend uh, to the full council, if they'd like, um, from our committee is to come again with maybe some type of uh, questionnaire documentation list in which individual councilors can fill it out and say, can you please provide me an explanation of, you know, community services, line item this, why is there a... But everyone submit it within a timeline so that it's more efficient for the response and everyone gets the same... Yeah. That way you're not getting 15 emails or whatever. Great. organizational and then um, um, keeping in mind that all those documents will all, and responses will also be public, part of our public record and actually um, all of these management documents, the responses that will include as part of the package and the minutes and you know with that stuff so people can take a look at it as well. Um, but I didn't present you know what that's going to look like because to me that's next. Um, but at least we're uh, for being coming back new to this we're kind of on the same page so I really appreciate that. Anything you want to add? Or? No, I think just, just kind of, you know, tacking on to what, what Tom was saying about, I was kind of the 80-20 rule. Yeah. So so at that high level, you know, if there is a significant change, yeah, what what what's what, what are the biggest cost drivers? What's what's 80% of the difference? That, you know, so kind of using that filter, not going way down to the weeds, but what are the real things that are driving mm -hmm. whatever we're seeing as a change? So for me, it's kind of the 80-20. Yeah, historically, you know, uh, you mentioned healthcare. Every department, of course, has that line, and so you'll see that. But the point is, you got to have a, co a conversation around the, the global effect of healthcare costs, as opposed to what does it mean in this department or that department. Yeah. You know, it, it is what it is. Let's have a conversation around why it is that way. And I, and I think there's some topics that should be included, regardless of any uh, net increase or decrease that should be included. So, as an example, personnel. You know, there might be changes um, because of uh, retirements or departures that can make a department fluctuate and hide what's really going on. So I think that, like, from a personnel and contract basis, you know, discussion around what is the impact of this year's portion of the contracts, whether it's, yeah, you, uh, without going, you know, the police department's going to be a 5% decrease, but yet community services a 15% decrease. Um, so. So to me, whatever it doesn't necessarily matter what the net is. It's about the it's about the function of the driver. Um, is what I would kind of like to. Um, and, and about presenting this in a different way. Yeah, and um, I, I just for the public record, I do want to mention that, um, and I'd want to get clarified to make sure I'm in compliance. But I think that if we are currently in any um, negotiations regarding contracts, or if there's any assumptions that are being made regarding. Um, upcoming contracts that those, because they're strategic uh, regarding nego labor negotiations, that that should be done in an executive session for us um, so that it doesn't uh, negate any of our effort to control or to provide increased benefits, however we want to look at that. And we do have two contracts I just, that we renegotiate. So I want to, yeah. I'm not saying the entire conversation around personnel should be put into executive sessions, but at least around those particular contracts and the impacts should, if I understood uh, recommendation from legal counsel in the past. Certainly that's a and, and I'll rely on, I mean, I'll kind of figure it out, but I'm pretty sure that you'll protect us as well. Yeah, we, we typically come and get some initial guidance, say, yeah. hey, this is what we're looking at. Right. Um, and often uh, encourage the unions to take the first step uh, in terms of just feeling them out yeah. what they're looking for. But we'll get some guidance along the way sure. for sure. Thank you. Anything else? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Better Pam, it's going to be a interesting process. <laughs> yeah. So I've kind of already started into the future agenda items and um, you know, I don't know if you and I um, and the rest want to have a conversation. Um, I wouldn't mind um, even though it's not norm to open it up for public comments, but um, you know, this might be an opportunity for our two guests and you know, to give us kind of a heads up maybe uh, what they're thinking. We're going to go through this prioritization about the future topics and areas that we're going to focus in on based on that prioritization list. Um, so you and I might be able to go through that on our own and be part of the regular group, so I don't know if we need to have this conversation now. 
um, if I've taken some, you know, and I'll share some of that. Yeah. But um, unless you object, I'd, I wouldn't mind opening it up to um, either there. Any Donovan is intensely interested and would like to be part of that. Conference. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, would anybody like to speak about uh, what the finance committee should look, consider for topics of discussion specifically? No. Okay. Thanks, anyways. Um, so I'm just going to kind of pass that by, but just add the things that you can add, the items that you've mentioned. So just, just for the public, um, not to think we've had private meetings, um, I've been fielding a lot of comments about things that we should be looking at. Um, so I, I, I will tell you that uh, county government is actually on that um, priority list, and it's in, at least in my highest priority list, primarily because of the historical increases that we've experienced in the last four or five years. Excuse me, I've actually already had a chance to speak with uh, Commissioner Jameson, um, who is a Scarborough resident, um, and uh, we have his complete support and uh, assistance in setting um, a discussion up with um, County Manager uh, Creighton, Peter Creighton, who is also a Scarborough resident, to come in and, and uh, help us in that dialogue. I think it will be very informative, and potentially even the new or uh, the finance director. Uh, I think his name is Alan Kelly for some reason. I'm not sure if that's right, but so I've got that definitely on the list. Good. Good. Uh, I know that there's been some um, comments about uh, looking at electrical cars and you know these energy efficiency initiatives um, in the town. Um, I'll call them new investments or new initiatives and label that one of those items under that. Um, the I'm going to kind of leave the school alone. I've gotten quite a bit around the school, but I think that um, that needs to be vetted through the joint committee and then particularly, you know, I'll forward anything that I receive on that um, on to the finance chair of the school department, um, uh, you know, Chris Iazzo. But um, my email is um, available online, so if anybody, you know, has some ideas that we'd like to look at, then please send it to us. It might be a subset of another conversation, but uh, we'll definitely take a look at it and see how we can fit it in to answer the questions. Yeah. Yeah, just because uh, we are on tape and uh, another chance for everyone to see your profile. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Robert Rovner, 14th Street. Just a question about um, the next fire truck, which I think is seven years away. I'm not sure of that figure, but I know it's quite a ways down the road. Rather than have to have a referendum for this, or if there are situations like this that come up, is there a way that the Finance Committee and the Town Council can try and structure something such as a, some sort of um, holding place within the budget that they're holding the money for the truck so that when the time comes, they've got it, and in the meantime, everybody in town knows it's being budgeted for you're not going to be surprised later. Sure. And I'm sure there might be other items other than the fire truck, that this nope. such as cars. Yep. So. Um, and actually, that's a good reminder because I did uh, receive uh, comments from a uh, citizen, um, a very involved citizen that uh, recommended us to consider how we do exactly that through um, the allocation, or at least the analysis of the allocation of depreciation and whether to put that money into a reserve account yeah, sure. dedicated strictly. Just to keep in mind, though, is that if I understand the town charter properly, um, it is not any bond greater than $400,000, it's any individual expenditure. So, so even if that is reserved and the money is available, the item still is required to go to voter approval, I believe. I think indebtedness is a, is a key component of that voter yeah. approval. I think if, we, if you reserve monies and have them in hand, yeah. you do not need voter approval. Hmm. Is my, so, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That'd be good would you be able to find out for, just yeah, a, a, for legal? Yep. Yeah, because yeah, I'd have that same question too. About right. Something. So that will definitely be discussed. The capital expenditure, the whole plan around uh, not only identifi identifying capital expenditures. Um, and by the way, when I say capital expenditures, it's uh, to me it's two pieces. Capital expenditures is equipment in order to operate the business, facility expenditures, new schools, whatever it might be, whatever library, whatever it might be, is a very different yeah. conversation. We have a complete vehicle and equipment replacement schedule, so right. we can. Put those yeah, programmed out as we speak. Yeah. Um, you can see where those where those yeah. needs are into the future. Just uh, in terms of in, uh, indebtedness, it's a fascinating discussion, and there's really some philosophical differences people yeah. have in terms of um, one of the things that seems to resonate with me anyway is one of the reasons you bond uh, an item is you let those that are enjoying the, the service, in this case a fire truck, who are benefiting from it in terms of it's in service, pay for it. Yep. as opposed to those um, you know, saving money who may not actually reap the benefit of that item. That's 
one of the philosophical mm -hmm. reasons you have long-term borrowing. And those who enjoy the benefit of a new road or a fire truck are actually paying for it. In the right. future. Right. Yeah. Huh. I hadn't thought of that. Huh. Uh, but, and, um, and of course, attractive rates help uh, you can, for it to make business sense. Mm -hmm. And the real issue is really, the cap, to me, the capital. Um, because actually I was on the council when we created it as well, but it's really about the reserve fund policy that we have in place because um, it would be, a, I would think it would be a subset of that reserve fund policy on how we, if we allocated debt reserves, restricted uh, monies for those type of uh, purchases. So um, I have both of those, making sure that the capital expenditures and the reserve fund policy, at least on my list of priorities. And the good news is you'll have the money when the, when the need is there. The bad news is it will put immediate pressures on your budget, mm -hmm. right, right. getting more, right. more pressure and our well. tax burden today for a future purchase. Right. So uh, there's trade-offs. There, there is trade-offs. You know, my only concern is just, my only concern with bonds, I think, is I'm not sure everybody understands what that means. It's kind of it's kind of kicking the can down the road. So, I mean, if there's some way to communicate what that indebtedness is and kind of, so I think some of it's just communication. Sure. And asking, yeah, asking we folks out there. We've with uh, not bond council, but our, our bond advisor, uh, Joe Katera, yeah. is very good in yeah. terms of giving a good 20, 25 minute presentation yeah. on kind of the whole theory and, and what's behind it. I mean, that's, that's a great conversation, though, philosophically, about what does the town want us to do about you pay for it now or do you have future users pay for it? It's, right. a, great, it's a great conversation. Right. Right. Uh, the other piece that I, I would, it really falls into the, the realm of joint conversation, but I don't think I'm saying any secrets. Um, I'm certain that the school board's coming forward as part of the budget proposal is to go one-to-one -one getting into high school. It's an, it's an interesting, provocative, perhaps, but certainly expensive endeavor and something that <coughs> deserves a good, a thorough conversation. And I know just because my staff has been working on it, they've been looking at this for years, so there's been a lot of research and thought that's gone behind it. My fear is that if we don't have a conversation maybe even advance of budget, it's so caught up in the other stuff of budget, you, you don't ever have that substantive conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's something, if time allows, the joint group could have, uh, you know, spent half an hour talking about and, and for, for you to learn more about their initiative um, because you'll get so, so fixated on the cost, it'll be hard right. to have uh -huh. um, a qualitative discussion. Yeah, yeah we, we talked about, and it's kind of a slide, but we talked about having some town meeting type Structures. I don't know if that would lend itself to kind of get some input from the community around. I think I think it's a ten thousand pound gorilla. I mean, it's one of those things that might dominate the conversation. But uh, George and I have folded in some sort of town hall forum, cool. generally on the budget. Yeah, uh, that could cover all sure. of the territory oh, of the yeah. school and town yeah. budget. So I can mention that. Um, so um, outside of being the finance chair, I'm also the liaison of the school board. So today I had a really good conversation with uh, Donna Beely, the chairman, chairwoman of the school board. And so one of the things we did talk about is having leadership um, sit down, leadership being the two chairs, the two finance chairs, um, and then the communications um, liaisons that we have, yeah. have sit down and talk about those town hall meetings, how we would like to deliver the message, and then what we have, um, what are our expectations, and then also um, expectations not only for what we're delivering but what we want to receive. Yeah. And so that will be uh, a very good process. I think uh, you know we kind of threw out some things because we're coffee was running really. <laughs> Starbucks coffee was starting to pour in, uh, so we had a lot of creativity. So we're definitely we have that on the. That's great. Definitely. Um, yeah, those town hall forums are ex are exciting. I'm also uh, somewhat um, nervous about them. Yep. That they really shouldn't be a talking head. George or I or both of us talking to people. It should be listening to people and doing our best to respond to their questions as, as we can. Yep. Roughly, um, again, this is not set in stone, but it, at least from a thought process in our conversation, it was first half hour might be um, the two chairs of the committees, not the uh, of the boards, do the presentation of the budget at the high level. Not specifically, well, this school is going to have one new teacher and um, this department is going to have one new employee, but at what are the high levels like the cost drivers and what is our total investment in schools and municipal services and things at that uh, level. The next half hour is direct questions regarding the, um, and we can change the order, of direct questions regarding that budget, um, which includes taking information and responding later if we have to because I don't like giving answers that I 
I'm not just going to give an answer for the sake of it. Um, and then the third part is, um, what are our next steps and what do you want us to consider? And ask those questions. You know, pose, here are five questions we want you to answer for us and see what we get for feedback. You know, one might be, you know, do you want us to try to save um, future expenditures uh, monies to pay for those fire trucks rather than bond it? You know, we can, and we're going we're gonna to be collaborative in that whole process. Uh, absolutely. And get everyone to kind of buy in. Um, I had a thought and I almost forgot about it. I don't remember what it was. I apologize. So, um, so the future meeting um, dates and times is our next item. So I went ahead and um, said that the second Wednesday, or third Wednesday, I always get it wrong. Second. The real boss in the back is telling me what's right. The second Wednesday of the month um, is a town council finance committee meeting. It will be at 4 o'clock. Um, unless I hear differently from uh, you and Councillor Donovan, I'll continue to have that. Um, it is an open forum, so everyone is welcome to join, including other councillors um, and uh, those staff that would wish to come as well, um, and the public. So um, I'm just going to continue with that, if that's okay. That's great. Um, I do think um, at least until we get closer and we have some more product action, uh, some product out of the joint committee, um, once we have some more, we may want to meet more. more. Yeah. Um, you know, probably every other week because um, things will get moving really, really fast. And we'll have the standard financial statements as yep. a standing agenda item. Sure. Yep. It won't be quite so painful next time. Now, now that you've given us the 101 yeah, um, educational version. And it'll be an interim period anyways, right? Because it'll be, Mar well, it won't be as of March end. It will be January, and I'd hope that we don't go month to month looking at line items. Good. I agree. You're a good guy. Um, last, I wanted, um, wanted to mention, and actually it's not on here, so I'm going to, uh, if you don't mind me adding, I just wanted to kind of give an update. I did have a chance to have a conversation with both Tom and with Ms. Porter. Um, so one of the items um, in my global kind of thinking is really to look at the trends of what, that are within the town financially. So um, I had talked with her about putting together really a trend sheet or trend analysis packet that would provide us with a historical trend of uh, property tax collection, um, excise tax, actually property tax might not have been on there, but definitely excise tax collection because um, that can go up and down, you know. Um, as well as several other ratios that I'm familiar with for municipalities, so like the debt capital ratio, reserve fund, um, unrestricted and restricted. Mm -hmm. um, and then in each of those, um, to set certain benchmarks. So there's some, uh, like by policy, I believe the reserve fund balance for the town must, is supposed to equal 8.35%, if I remember right. So, you know, where are we in comparison to that benchmark? Uh, because it's, it's interesting that you mentioned, you mentioned liabilities, I mentioned the reserve fund, so credit analysts out there when they do the bonding, one agency looks at liabilities and how much debt you're carrying on and how much you're getting off. The other one looks at the reserve balances, and so it all depends on what you're most comfortable with, and so I think that using both of those as, as uh, tools for us um, will be useful. That fund balance policy has, was updated a few years ago, so it, I think it's online, but maybe worthwhile to review yeah. it. They do do something with yep. the capital. So um, Ms. Porter's team right now is in the middle of an audit, um, the year end, or the audit. So condolences. At the end. Condolences. Condolences. <laughs> so um, there, has been, there has been no stress in getting that done immediately, but it's something that's um, on the horizon. Um, and the real reason is that I would hope that we start looking at those big factors because, um, and this kind of, to me, uh, at least on a personal basis, personal comment to Mr. Rodner's original question around the manager. Um, I mean, in this form of government, we don't micromanage or we don't get involved in the intrinsic detail of a contract negotiating, negotiations regarding pricing. That's why we hire and pay the manager very well what he gets paid, and then he hires the director of finance and public works and whatever the other. Um, but if there are concerns regarding a particular contract or issue, you know, it is per the purview of the council and the finance committee to then ask the questions and the details around that. Um, I'll be honest with you, just on that particular issue, I thought it was a very good response, Mr. Hall, um, and a very good question. But I hope that we're really, really um, careful in certain volatile indices that are out there um, that a lot of people watch. So while energy pr uh, gas prices might be down, that generally means at some point it's going to bottom out, and if we don't budget 
well, it could explode, and then we're going to see, and we used to see this, or we still see this, and um, a lot of people are like, really? It's in salt that goes onto the roads. You know, if you don't, you know, the price of salt this year might be down, and you can sit there and say, well, next year, so it's a, it's a lot of forecasting, and you never really know what's going to happen. So I just, um, sometimes we guess well, because it is a guess, and sometimes we don't, and it's all, uh, you know, with the salt issue, it's, it's about, you know, how on earth do you know what Mike other nature is going to deliver next winter? Uh, Mike called me up uh, the day before the salt contract ended last spring, and we filled the barn because mm -hmm. he was really concerned that if we waited and did not, uh, you know, fill it back up with the following year's money, and we were able to cobble together yeah. funds in public works to be able to yeah. buy basically two batches of salt last year, but mm -hmm. we're reaping the benefit this year. Mm -hmm. So it's a good point. Yeah, uh, but the second piece of that is that there's also some due diligence, I think, on behalf of the council as a whole, and the finance committee, I would think, would want to be involved in making a recommendation. That is, that what do we do with a surplus at the end of the year after everything is tallied? If there is a thirty thousand dollars surplus or a million dollars surplus, do we have a? Um, I don't remember if we have a standard policy. I don't think we do. But you know, what is our approach? Do we, um, you know, to be honest, if we have a thirty thousand dollars surplus? Um, I generally would not believe giving it back to the people. It would actually be more onerous and more costly for us to try to rebate that to the people. But if we have a million dollars surplus, um, those are strategic decisions, I think. And maybe that decision is then codified into a policy so that there's, you know, it's like what they say, when you get a tax refund, one-third goes to past debt, one-third goes to current needs, and the other third should be saved. You know, maybe we come up with a policy that kind of looks at that too. I mean, so there's the opportunity for us to set policy yeah. in place regarding that, since we don't. Um, yeah, again, without the, micromanaging. The fund balance policy really speaks to that. If the council, nor the staff, yeah. they'll do anything. The auditors, if there's surplus at the end of the budget year, it goes to fund balance. Yeah. Uh, similarly, if there's a deficit, they pluck it from from fund, fund balance. balance. Now, to, to your point, if you want to return that to the taxpayer, the simplest and best way, in my opinion, is to do it through the budget process. You can include that as a yeah. revenue, if you will. It, it reduces Reduction, the amount to be raised well, through taxation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that, that comes with its own set of perils and challenges. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and my experience, in a budget this size, you're going to have a surplus, generally speaking. You should, if you're efficient. Um, it's not going to be huge. Uh, but you should have something at least, um, gen what I've seen, and, you know, I've worked for a bigger company than this, and I've, I've also worked for a slightly smaller one. Um, you know, 5% is not unheard of, but it's uh, ver that's a very rich surplus. Um, so it's about what you want to do. Um, personally, um, returning it to the people is problematic, and, and the reason is because, um, at least at this time, and the reason is because we don't know what's coming down the line in the next three years. Four years. Um, so, if, and, and the reason is because uh, this budget that's being passed by the state is only two-year scope. So we don't know what's going to happen then to the outliers that didn't get passed in this budget that the governor is proposing that may happen in that two years. So, building up a stronger reserve, or even maybe creating a tax stabilization account where excess goes into that, um, so that there's a direct correlation, so that they can see that. Because I think that if you put it into just a general fund balance. A lot of citizens don't see that, and you can sit there and show them in a rate stabilization. I know the county government, when I served on their board, um, or at least on the finance committee, uh, finance uh, advisory, they have a rate stabilization account. So a certain portion of surplus goes into that that is dedicated solely to... Now, there's some nuances with that, too, because some people say, well, you know you're going to use it every year, so why do it? But um, it comes down to what is uh, the best policy that the whole council kind of thinks about. And we're currently trying to build our fund balance up to a point where we're at the 112 level, right. which we're not at right now. Some of us believe that should be higher. And some believe that should be higher. <laughs> some <laughs> believe it should be lower, but we're right. not where we right. say we're no, supposed to be. Yeah. So. Uh, I miss a to build it up to what level? Uh, so 8.3%. Oh, we're okay. not at that level. Okay. It's 112. Basically, one month carry forward. Yeah. And that's at the lower end of what all of the financial analysts are looking for. Yeah. You're saying um, two months. Falmouth has, uh, they're in the order of 20%, which yeah. seems to be obscene to me. That's a, that means and you're keeping a lot of taxpayer money that you don't need to operate exit. the town. And, and actually, to get to, you know, I know Sean talked about, you know, some trend lines. And if it's easy to do and not a lot of extra work, sometimes really helpful to me is to have some benchmark to say what's, what's you know, best practice, what do others have. That would be really helpful just to benchmark some of those ratios I think Sean's looking for. 
to where others are. So I mean that that example to found was just a great puts it in perspective of I mean, that would be helpful if it's possible. By main standards, they are the outlier yeah. of the yeah. other way. Yeah. Um, both but, ways are closer to us. But, but some state average or regional average or national norm, just something that says yeah. if it's yeah. easy to find. If and it, it depends on, you know, if we had one large uh, property tax business in town and if they went under, that would hurt us. We would probably have a higher fund balance just to cover that. Right. You know, like right. the paper mills up north. When right. Oh, yeah. Down. Yeah, we've seen the impact. Scarborough doesn't have that issue, so we're lucky. <coughs> and, and maybe Falmouth does, and that's why they do. I don't, right. I don't know Falmouth that much. You know, and if this, I mean, if if there's specifics, if we can um, get Council Donovan on the um, on the same page, and then we submit to Tom, you know. Um, so as an example, if we want reserve fund to be compared to a state average, or um, I mean, to me, policy is one benchmark automatically. I mean, our own policy. Right, right, what right, is right. our policy? And then the other one is, you know, what's the state average, or what is the expectation of um, the credit well, agency well. that actually looks at that? What is their preference? Just so that you can see what you know where it is. Yeah, that way. I'm keeping notes, I've got five or six different things that you've mentioned. But if there are other things yep. you're interested in beyond this, by all means, you know, mention them, and we can yep. prepare these these historical trend analyses for you. Yep. Um, and I just wanted to mention I saw the uh, data sheet that you provided regarding the main revenue sharing. That was great information as far as um, how the uh, increases over time and then the decreases over time have occurred in comparison to the municipal uh, overall assessment to the town. I thought that was a really, I hope you got a copy of that, but yeah. I thought that was really informative, so I appreciate that. Um, and just in closing comments before we uh, adjourn, I just wanted to mention um, um, hopefully for our fellow councillors, but um, and I know that they will anyways, but also to the citizens regarding the news around the budget proposal, and there's a lot of, um, um, what's the word? Um, uh, I can't think of the word right now. There's a lot of questions. I'll be nice about it. A lot of questions, and I hope that people understand is that um, what, the gov the, the, what the governor has proposed, or his administration has proposed, is a benchmark that really can't be measured on the impact on the town of Scarborough at this particular point because there's just so much and there's so much that goes over time and resources. If we try to go, at least and this is my perspective, if we try to go to a state resource to provide us with an analysis, it would be so costly it wouldn't be really advantageous because it will change as the legislature convenes, meets and changes. Mm -hmm. So because a lot of people have called me and said, hey, you know, what's this going to do to us? You know, and about the whole, not, I mean, Scarborough is very, um, healthy regarding nonprofit. I mean, we have. I mean, think about it. Piper Shores is a waterfront property that's nonprofit, Maine General, and their campus. So there's a lot of questions. Piper Shores pays full taxes. I just want. To oh, I'm sorry. They just, okay. They are our largest taxpayer. Okay. Yeah. Um, corporate taxpayer, right? Yes. Yep. Well, largest taxpayer of any two. Kind. Okay. Because <laughs> um, a couple of residents that pay big taxes, like there's a distinction between the two. Um, but um, but anyway, so I apologize for making that. I thought that they were nonprofit for some reason. But you know, Maine General Campus, I believe, is nonprofit. So I mean, there's impacts that is very hard to measure. So I'm just asking citizens to kind of be patient as we work through this because um, it's just it's going to be difficult. And I know Tom, that you're working on a lot of um, um, gap analysis, if, uh, what I'll call, based on where we are today and what some of those impacts are that we're kind of guaranteed. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people, I'm comfortable in believing Maine revenue sharing is going away. I believe that um, GPA for students, uh, student funding of education is going to stay flat, if not decrease. I mean, there's some things that are pretty clear. There's some things that are very obscure and may not happen. So um, I just want people to understand that we're trying to respond as quickly as possible, but you have to be cognizant that that information will change as soon as decisions are made in Augusta. And it's a huge moving. Maine Municipal Association, uh, who gave us a presentation, yeah. uh, a little bit of it. Also, sometimes, depending on the type of the, the process or whatever that the state's trying to do, they'll ask communities to, to kind of give yeah. them some information, and then they put that out there. And so that's one of the ways we sort of see some mm -hmm. of this. Yeah. We, we've done some initial modeling of the, uh, the impact, yeah. and your points are well taken that this is a proposal. It's going to go through the full legislative process and is likely to change. But certainly elements of it will survive. Mm -hmm. um, and as you provide the analysis, I mean, the emphasis is that, and I want to hear from you guys, so I don't want to talk, I'll be the only one, is that um, it's for information purposes only. It doesn't mean that it's concrete um, because those assumptions that were taken can change 
dramatically based on the actions of the legislature. So just to keep it in mind, because you know, people are concerned when they heard that homestead exemption is going to be taken away, right. um, mortgage um, mortgage payment or the interest on mortgage payments may be no longer an exemption, at least at the state level. There's a lot of implications in a lot of areas, so a lot of people get nervous. Um, now, I'm just forecasting impact on our budget. What you're referencing are things that are going to hurt people's pocketbooks right. on a personal level, um, but at the end of the day, it's coming out of your pocket right. Right. One, one way or another. So Interestingly, a couple of the elements of this proposal actually we benefit from um, based on the initial analysis. Yeah. Um, in the end, when you add it all up, we will be a net loss, I suspect. Yeah. A net loss, yeah. 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 So I don't know if you had any closing no. remarks or? No, no, actually I think it's a good process and okay. appreciate everything. Yeah. And, and, and I do want to mention that um, I know that Council uh, Chairperson uh, Holbrook is working with uh, Vice Chair um, Katarina to um, get a meeting with our legislative uh, uh, representatives and to really be involved with them during this process as well. So there's going to be full collaboration with them, at least from an information sharing. So I don't want the people to think that you and I are the only ones working on this, but uh, Jessica and Jean Marie are definitely working on that, that end as well. So I really appreciate it. Um, anything else from the two of you? All right. Um, if there is no objection. It's about 4:20. No, sorry, 5:23 p.m. Uh, move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Just think if I voted no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, yeah. very much. Nice job.